I'm Jeff Apodaca. Eric Strauss. And welcome to Let's Meet in the Middle this week. It and, is a somber beginning. Well, and we're all going to be talking about crime and some other things. Yeah. But, but you know, we always like to start to show off with, with topics. And this week, it's a little hard because this weekend, as we all know, yeah. Kobe Bryant passed. Um, and I'm a huge yeah. Laker fan. And, and we're I, both fathers. Well, we're both fathers. And we're both and, Lakers fans. And what, I'm a and, huge Lakers well, fan, Well, what you know, what I think what, yeah. you know, he's become such a good father. And then he was with Gigi, his 13-year-old daughter. They look so and, alike, um, too. Wow. Well, and, it, and it's, it's sad. It's humbling. Um, but let's also remember that it wasn't just them two. Nine people, they've now yeah. released the names in the pictures. Nine yeah. people passed on the helicopter. Thoughts and prayers to all of them. Well, and, you know, and some of my friends, and I lived in LA for 20 mm -hmm. years, yeah, and, and we had season tickets. Big. He was Mr. LA. Well, let me tell you, and and uh, you know, I was a little upset at, Sha uh, at Kobe when Shaq left because they did kind of break it up because of the two superstar thing. If they would have stuck, if they would have two if, more championships easily, at least three. If they had stuck, to, stuck together, they would have probably won six in a row. Ego like got in the did. way. Never yeah. let that happen to and you. And so and that kind of angered me because I was a big Shaq guy. But uh, Kobe uh, was a big person yeah. back in L.A. and gave back a lot. And a lot of people say, why is he flying in a helicopter? Well, Kobe flew in helicopters all Everywhere. the time. Yeah, all over the place. But I will tell you, we lived, we didn't live in Calabasas where they crashed, but we lived just about 45 minutes mm -hmm. south of there. And this time of the year, I'm telling you, they have fog. They have... Uh, and yeah, it, it's and dangerous. It, and it sounds like... Yeah that they probably looked, he lived in Orange County, which is an, an hour away, mm -hmm. probably took off in clear skies. Hit Re fog. Reports, reports have it that the helicopter made an erratic turn. Probably the, the instruments probably couldn't oh. see something. Made around, and I hate to say this, he was in a top line helicopter, so equipment probably wasn't failure. And we don't know yet, uh, but, um, but anyway. The whole this, thing, it feels like the day the music died. You know what I mean? It, it feels like one of those where everybody kind of collectively stops and, and hugs their kids and just feels, uh, you know, your heart goes out, oh, yeah. you know, and you watch and the doing, kid grow up right in front of us. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, so I, literally, first of all, I think the greatest trade ever yeah. Was, oh, yeah. was Charlotte. <laughs> How they got and, and Kobe. How we gave get Kobe? We gave up. Nobody. Nobody. We, oh, we gave up. Floppy, Floppy Divock to get Kobe. Oh. It was awesome. I think it was the best trade Incredible ever. Incredible anyway, trade. But more importantly, yeah. let's make sure we're saying our prayers to all Thoughts nine and victims the and the families. And there's yeah. three, there's still three daughters and Vanessa, the wife, yep. and the other people. So let's make sure we're saying prayers about them. And, yep. Thoughts and, and prayers uh, to Charles everyone Park. involved, for sure. What's going on um, in your world? So uh, I just want to talk briefly about the coronavirus. Oh, and that's another reminder serious, as uh, our, as the legislature, as Congress sits up there and does nothing, basically, that... We've got to have a better immigration system. I mean, right now they're trying to rush Americans out of there. And everybody thinks that, you know, uh, the, our southern border is just about Mexico. And there's people who come in through the back door all the time until we start knowing who's coming in our country, why they're coming in. And, and, and these Uber viruses that are out there are going to be at and the I, wolf store, and, I, and been, I can promise you that. And I haven't been following directly, but in China, basically the community that, that got sick first, yep. they were selling illegal live animals mm. with diseases, and that's how that community got sick, right? 830 and, sick, uh, 25 confirmed death as of Friday in China. In China. In China. A and the numbers are going to keep going up, and that's a scary thing right Well, and there. you know what's serious when the Chinese government literally has shut down their Locked down everything. And mass transit, everything yep. else. And now there is one, there's one, maybe two here in the United States. Um, Absolute. But, not, but, but they came from more China. More frightening China. results of communism and socialism. And if we don't get our acts together, our country's headed that way, by the well, way. So you know, I'm gonna, you know I'm going to politicize that. One of the things that, I wanted so. to bring up is, um, if everybody saw last week, Lonnie Talbert, our county commissioner, mm -hmm. this is his eighth year. He's termed out. There he is right there. Great guy. Republican. And they voted him as chairman of the commission this year. And the Democratic Party and the Dems, my Dems, are upset because two Dems voted for him to be chairman. And there are majority Democrats. And again, uh, how about voting for the best well, person? Well, that was my point. And actually, some of them voted for him because he hasn't been chair. And he's been there for eight uh, years. And then the, the Borg, and you, the and Borg and well, how can you not vote Democrat? How can you vote? Well, it's like and idiotic. I will tell you, Lonnie is a, has been a great commissioner, not just for his district, but for the state or for the city. I think he's a great commissioner. He's done a great job, pro-business guy. Um, and I'm glad. I'm, he's a friend also, but I'm very proud of him. And I'm proud of Michael Casadas and the other Democrats that actually voted for him. 
Good for him. Yeah, I'm very I, proud, I'm of, proud of any Democrat that can actually just uh, take their blinders off and actually vote for the right person. I mean, this is my most frustrating thing. It's kind of the impetus of our show again. Right. It's like uh, we don't have to disagree on everything. You know, there, there has to be some type of thing where we can look at somebody and say, who's the best person for the job, not who's the best Democrat for well, you the know, job. You know, it's funny. Which uh, is kind of tragic. And you and I agreed we're going to have a show probably in about three or four weeks about this. Mm -hmm. But I was up in Santa Fe last week having dinner, having lunch with my dad and some mm -hmm. of his business buddies. And what really came out was there's four or five very conservative Democrats, and they play right into your conversation how they're like, with the, the, with the left kind of taking over our party. Yep. You know, I don't know if I can be a Democrat anymore, and uh, but we're actually going to invite them on the show because we want. We've been talking about doing a show yeah. how people literally vote for parties even if they don't agree yeah, with the no, status so of parties. Well, so we're going to have that. We're going to have that. Well, look weeks. at the Democrats running the top to bottom ad during the Grisham campaign. Just vote top to bottom Democrat. Like, right. don't think about it. Just vote top to bottom. It's like who's who wants to teach? And they've had kids on that commercial. Yeah. Why? Well, and it's funny because we're gonna, we, we have three or four guests Oi. that actually want to come on that show, so we'll be talking Oi, about it. Boy. But don't forget, uh, yeah. today we're going to be talking about crime. You can follow us on Facebook, Facebook Live, on our YouTube channel. Yep. You can always uh, track Eric during the One week. One House Strauss. One House Strauss. On Twitter. You can follow me at Democrats for Democracy or New Mexico Minute. Oh, and by the way, you can find me on podcast now. Ooh. So on your iPhone, if you click the podcast link, House of Strauss is there. Well, cool and to that? be honest with you, we're supposed to be putting all our yeah, stuff we're, on we, podcasts. We we're supposed to be doing that. So we, we, need, we need to do that. Yes. But we also, Eric and I are also starting our little conversations on Democrats with <laughs> yeah, and our social media. Yeah, that's spicier and spicier. Hey, 9,000 9, people, people engaged last week. Many we had, of them calling me names. We had, joking. We had over, a couple. We had over 350 uh, comments. But hey, let's get started. Yeah. Let's meet in the middle. Let's meet in the middle. In a time of a divided America, two people from different points of view sit down to talk about the problems, to talk about ideas, to talk about life, and to find common ground. It is now time for Let's Meet in the Middle with your hosts, Eric Strauss and Jeff Apodaca. Welcome back to Let's Meet in the Middle. Joining us now is Bernalillo County Sheriff Manny Gonzalez, Manny, thanks for coming in today. Uh, the impetus behind this show was the record number of homicides. I'm gonna read you this from a journal article, a combination of, uh, uh, here, looking back at this year, quadruple homicide in the South Valley Mobile Home Park, nine-year-old girl found in a drainage tunnel, and a dispute over an Uber ride turned deadly. And that's just some of the headlines that have made the news in 2019. 82 homicides, five of them suspicious deaths, so a total of 87 suspicious, suspicious deaths. deaths. What is your opinion on why crime is spiking so high, uh, a record year again for Albuquerque? Well, you know, it, what's concerning is that, you know, it used to be uh, maybe criminal on criminal, but what you're seeing is some of those high-profile cases have even led to the death of a U.S. Postal uh, mm -hmm. employee, right. also a UNM baseball player. And so this is really plaguing our, our, our community. I think some of the things that are leading into this are just the uh, Department of Justice and the uh, situation with the Albuquerque Police Department is sometimes driving that. What also has happened since 2010 is what we were seeing is we were seeing a decline in crime. Mm -hmm. After 2010, for whatever reason, things started going up. And ever since then, we haven't been able to decrease crime. And I think that's for many reasons. There's the issues, uh, I believe, in uh, the depopulation of the jail. You've had issues with the uh, case management uh, through the Supreme Court and how those cases are. Well, Manny, let's talk a little bit because the Attorney General, William Barr, came yes. in in November. Yeah. Yes. And you were right there. And, I mean, I could, I, you know, in the article it talked about, uh, you know, he's rolling out of the, the most violent high-crime cities um, and, and a program underway to attack on a national level. Obviously, he ranks, or the FBI ranks, uh, Albuquerque number two. Um, when you start looking at it, violent crime is massive. Um, and so it goes, he goes into a lot of different things. But I know he's really working with the, the Bernalillo County Sheriff's Department and yourself. Tell us a little bit about that, because why, why, yeah. why are they picking you guys versus APD or any other organization? And we get the crime in Albuquerque, and we're always one of the tops. But tell us a little bit about this project and the, and the crime areas and, and what you guys are doing with the, with the uh, U.S. Attorney. Well, first of all, I believe it's because of our relationship and our willingness to collaborate with the federal agencies. Mm -hmm. So 
per officer, we pro nobody has more of a commitment to having task force officers than us. So I believe he sees that as a positive. So we're willing to take those cases and go federal. And we know that there's more teeth in that system. So mm -hmm. we know that if we're going to have these people being prosecuted, they're going to be prosecuted for 5, 10, 20 years, and we're not going to be seeing them on the street the next day. Right. Yeah. Um, and so we talked about since 2010, uh, crime was actually going down for a bit. And then all of a sudden, uh, we, we get this uh, 2014 opinion from Justice Chief uh, Charles Daniels, who said, uh, you can't charge people exorbitant bonds. Is it frustrating for an officer who arrests somebody in Albuquerque, even for, and the criminals have figured this system out. If I steal a car and I just claim I'm broke, they're going to let me walk either way because they don't feel like auto theft, which is a violent crime, by the way. You're always like home theft, auto, all these thefts aren't violent crimes. And these are violent crimes. They violate people's sanctity of their homes, of their vehicles. Um, and so what is it, what on the ground, boots on the ground, what do officers feel about when you see somebody back on the street that you just arrested? Oftentimes frustration. Uh, they want to see uh, that people are being held accountable for those crimes. These, these crimes are costing us uh, exorbitant amounts of, of, of money out of our pockets. There was just a 14% increase of in our insurance rates that all of us have to pick up. Yep. On a daily basis, if you go to any convenience store, uh, a Walgreens, a CVS, these people are at will just taking uh, property and stealing whatever off the shelves and nobody's being held accountable. Nobody's being charged. And to give you an example, one of the things I explained to uh, Attorney General Sessions when he came down is that one day I was at a meeting at the district attorney's office and I happened to be sitting next to an FBI agent and he was working some cases up in the Southeast Heights. But basically what he told me is that they were uh, looking at one of the offenders, nine felony charges from years standing back, no convictions. Oh. So you're dealing with a very, very volatile situation, but there's no accountability in the criminal justice system where they're getting convicted. Manny, we've talked about it. We've, been, we've talked about it. We've actually had a whole show about it because there's a debate going on, and hopefully the legislators that are in session today or, or this, this month are going to fix that. But a lot of different people blame it on the judges. A lot of different people blame it on the DAs. From law enforcement, do you guys get involved in that? Because right now the judges are, because I've been telling Eric, if you look mathematically, 53% of the judges are holding those folks you know, in jail because they see them unsafe. It's really 47% of the judges have decided, well, the, law, the DAs, the law enforcement aren't doing their job, so I have to release them. From the law enforcement side, are you seeing that, or is that frustration with you all? No, we're, we're not playing the blame game. What we're doing is we're going a different route in terms of holding, holding people accountable. That's why we're going the federal route, and we're collaborating. Smart. We're actually getting uh, de our deputies federally deputized through some of the federal agencies so that we're oh. taking those cases federal, so that when these people are very violent, we take them off the streets because we are dealing with cases with that deal with the cartels and other uh, other violent organizations. I mean, I, I, even that, that teenager, okay, so we, we all work with, I'm, I'm a 25 year veteran teacher, so I've worked with teenagers for, you know, a quarter century of my life. And um, when you see headlines of teen gets 30 days for murder, I mean, that's gotta resonate to everyone that you go to arrest. You know what I mean? The, as you see these younger felons start to, like there, there just seems to be no consequence in, in New Mexico whatsoever. Headlines that I, like that I think are just destroying the state. Uh, but, but do you guys talk about stuff like that? Like or how, does, how does it, that is it frustrating? How does, affect, how does that affect the morale yeah. within the office with the officers out on the street? Well, our officers are committed. They're not going to stop, uh, you know, enforcing the law. But it's in, what we believe it's sending the wrong message to uh, people that are committing crimes. And we need to hold these people accountable because if we don't get a handle on this, look at where we're at as a state. We're 50th in things that we should be number one in. Well, yeah. we're 50th in the economy. Then we're number one in certain crime areas. Right. Yeah. Auto theft, yeah. high level of violence in homicides, violent crimes. We need to get a handle on that. So we need to have a strategy, and our strategy is to collaborate, extreme collaboration. It starts from the bottom up, and that's why when we had this approach, it really got the attention of these federal yeah. agencies because what we did uh, was phenomenal, and I give the credit to my deputies of these operations we were doing in the city. The information we took from those operations is what we sent to the DOJ, 
and they awarded us $1.2 million. We're just waiting for the release of that money so we can start these operations throughout Albuquerque. Now I'm seeing, because Raul Torres and I, we've <laughs> talked a little bit about too, I see him taking more cases to the federal, the federal side because he says they're harder and they have more teeth. Is, is that a solution that you guys are looking at, working together, going down that federal, that federal um, law enforcement that way within the judicial system because it, it works better? Or can we it solve it? It seems tragic, we, doesn't can, it? Well, it, it just seems like now all of a sudden your sheriff's department's moving that way, that way. The DA's office has definitely moved that way because they, they feel like they have more teeth there. Are you seeing more of that? I think are, we you, are you and the DA working together? On yes, that? he called me this morning. Okay. So, <laughs> so he wants us to get more involved with some of these uh, groups that he has in Albuquerque, and we're willing to. It's, it's what the need is right now is we're so in demand, and I mean, so we don't have to worry about job security, but we're getting requests from, you know, we do our stuff on the local level. Now you're looking at the uh, district attorney wants us to get involved in some of the state level investigations they have going on in house. And we have the federal portion. So we're willing to collaborate, but we just don't only collaborate with federal agencies. We're collaborating with public health, faith-based groups, the businesses. Mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're trying to collaborate to help solve some of these other issues because it's not just crime you're seeing in the streets. There's other social problems that we have to address, homelessness. Well, in our next segment, we're going to well, talk a little bit about that. But I, I want to ask you a question on, the, sure. on collaboration because... You know, we've talked about it. It was big news. You know, Operation Surge, I think it was, where yeah, APD and the state police the state got police, together. Yeah. And they went in and over, I don't know, a couple week period, they arrested over 280 uh, people. And 80% of them and walked. And then we found out later, like 83% <laughs> walked. One, were you guys involved in that? Were you part of that Ugh. conversation? And I don't want to blame anybody because I think law enforcement did their job. They rounded people yep. up, and then all of a sudden it didn't get through the court system. Most of the cases were dismissed. If you were, or were like Bernalillo, was Bernalillo Sheriff yeah. involved in that? And how's that collaboration going with APD and the other departments? Yeah. We weren't involved in that specific operation or were we considered in that operation. It, it happened very rapidly. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, we support the state police and we support any law enforcement agency. I think a lot of people were relieved just to see that there was law enforcement being done. I think the fact that people are being stopped for these offenses just for traffic violations is a big uh, kind of relief for some of the citizens because they're virtually sometimes they're seeing no presence of stops. Right. So mm -hmm. it's anything, a little bit of something's better than nothing. So I, I read the DOJ report. I, I mean, top to bottom, I read it all the way through. And to me, what the one theme I found throughout the whole DOJ report was a lack of communication uh, between SWAT, between boots on the ground officers, between administration. Um, how is the communication going between the sheriff's office and APD? Great, we you know? uh, deconflict when we do these operations in the city. Mm -hmm. So part of what you're talking about is, I believe, over-specialization. Yeah. So when you start over-specializing, you mm -hmm. start having internal com communication collapse yeah. And what you need to do is flatten that down kind of like a business so people communicate and that you're more effective and efficient mm -hmm. with the taxpaying dollars. So that's just the kind of a failure of uh, operationally of some things that sometimes uh, organizations run into. Yeah, because I, I live close to where you have, I don't know, they put a lot of equipment where I'm at. And I'm seeing kind of a more influx uh, lately of more militarized looking equipment. Are you guys from from the feds getting using that money to kind of get more kind of militarized equipment so you can have these special forces or in the flattening is everybody getting trained to use this SWAT type of equipment? No, when we're flattening out our organization, it's to communicate so we can get more efficiency and production mm -hmm. out of what we have with our existing resources. Mm -hmm. So what we're trying to do is collaborate with the public because we have a limited number of deputies. So what we try to do is collaborate with the public and other uh, <clears throat> government entities, local, state, or federal, so we can get the most bang for our buck. Gotcha. We have to work as a team in order to be effective and get and solve yeah. this uh, crime crisis. We need to crisis. go to commercial. Yeah. When, we, when we come back, I want to talk about the team. I want to talk about mm -hmm. the communications and the yeah. technology side of it because sure. the mayor's been talking a little bit about that. But don't forget, you can follow us on Facebook at Let's Meet in the Middle. Um, House of Strauss and um, New Mexico Democrats for Democracy. Yeah, join and that conversation. That's fun. It's fun. Um, and <laughs> NMD4D. Woo! And we want to thank Indigo Mortgage, our sponsor. Yep, ben Lucero Indigo does a Mortgage. great job for mortgages. We'll be back right after this. I'm Ben Lucero, president and owner of Indigo Mortgage. We are a locally owned and operated mortgage company right here in New Mexico. This means your loan officers and processors are right here to serve you. 
Indigo Mortgage offers better rates and terms than that of big banks and out-of-state lenders. Our mortgage divisions include residential, commercial, construction, reverse mortgages, and VA mortgage loans. Let us serve you with an exemplary level of care. Indigo Mortgage, because nobody cares more about your mortgage loan. Find us on Facebook at Let's Meet in the Middle, or you can email us at meetinthemiddlenm at gmail.com. Get along. Welcome back to Let's Meet in the Middle. Joining us again, Sheriff Manny Gonzalez. Thanks for taking the time with us yeah, today. Yeah, Manny, really You're appreciate welcome. this. And uh, hopefully this is good insight yeah. for everybody. Really blown away at the information I've learned so far. I do want to begin with a couple operations you guys have going. Triple Beam and Relentless Pursuit. Can yes. you inform the public about Because for those frustrated citizens out there that are sitting there going, man, the cops aren't doing anything. You know, I, I really want you to speak to that okay. and that you guys really, I think you don't go into police work unless you want to make a difference, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely, Eric. So uh, Operation Triple Beam is the operation we did at the tail end of the summer. And that's where we were working in collaboration with the U.S. Marshals. That's probably mm -hmm. what, that's what actually brought the Attorney General to uh, Albuquerque okay. is that effort. And because of our heavy lifting of our deputies, uh, they were able to mm -hmm. uh, probably produce about 300 arrests. Uh, 200 and I believe about 25 of those were felony arrests. And were they were you targeting specific types of felons or what was the goal with these operations? We target you know just any kind of activity that was going on because there there was a need based on what we were gaining from the public and mm -hmm. some of the business owners, some of the citizens in the southeast part of town. That was where the requests were coming and somewhere on the west side of town. So we met them uh, kind of in the middle, but we met them out there in the streets. And that's what we need to do in these operations is that you don't always want to have them do an invite and say, come to my office. What we do right. is you tell us where you're at and we would go out there and visit with them in their communities. Mm, tell us a little nice. bit about uh, Relentless Pursuit. That's a new program, a newest initiative you guys are rolling out. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, that's another commitment that the uh, Department of Justice has made. The Attorney General mentioned that with one of the seven cities, Albuquerque was selected. That is coming up very soon. And so operationally it's going to be coming out very soon so there's going to be a big uh, delegation of federal agents along with us working as the lead uh, local law enforcement agency to help them operate here in the city of albuquerque gotcha so let's go back because one of the things we talked about is communications yes yep. right and i know the law enforcement because um, that's one of the things it's called cat right it's cat cat cad C -A -C cat sorry C -A -D. Community, commu uh, computer aided dispatch and so to my understanding, the state police is on one unit, Santa Fe Police Department's on another unit, you guys are on one, APD's on one. Some of my friends that are in police and in, in law enforcement around the state, their biggest frustration is that technology-wise, not being able to share, share that information. You guys still see into that? Because Mayor Keller's really been pushing on extra funding to really kind of upgrade APD. Tell us a little bit about that and some of the frustration we have on sharing technology. Sure. All law enforcement has been working on this for far before, long before two years ago. We've been working on this since I've been in office five years ago, and uh, it still hasn't come to fruition. But what's happening right now is that what you want to do is have the interoperability to be able to work, uh, call on the state police. There are things that we have in place that can patch those systems on currently, but what we want to do is have that system uh, work without having to patch that together to get uh, Homeland Security available mm. to make that happen. We should be able to do that at the flip, flip of a switch. And that's what we're working on right now. Would it be centralized <clears throat> within the Sheriff's Department? Would it be centralized at the state level? At the state level. So this like, let's and say- And it should be at the state level. And it should be, right? With the state yes. police, they're, with, they're- With every agency in the state. Right. So everybody right. needs to have the interoperability that if we have an incident, whether it be here in Bernalillo County, Santa Fe County, Cibola County, any county in the state, that we should be able to deploy resources right. or help based on that system. Um, I want to I want to get touch bases just on the thought of what is community policing and one trend I've noticed because uh, you if you look back at policing there was always partners 
I always right. wonder why did they, because like even when you do a home project, it's so much easier if you got an extra set of hands, yeah. you know, and I always wondered why did we get away from partners and how are we getting back to community policing, like boots on the ground, guys going into neighborhoods, that type of thing. A lot of things change in the 20th century, like the, the way we communicate, uh, the way we uh, move around. So transportation, all those things m change community policing. But what we need to get back and what's most fundamental about policing is showing up to a call when you call me. Mm -hmm. And so really yeah. the partnerships right. that we're forming right. are no different than us sitting here. And when you call us, we go in there and find out what, mm -hmm. what's uh, plaguing you. What's, what's your issue? What's your problem? Mm -hmm. Why are you calling us for service? Yeah. And so it's really getting back to the basics of figuring out what's going on in your neighborhoods. Our best resources are the people that live in those neighborhoods, so we have to be connected with them. Uh, so many people use that buzzword, community policing. Everybody tries yeah. to get funny, not based on community policing. Mm -hmm. But the bottom line is when somebody calls you, you have to show up. It can't be over a website. It can't be over a phone. It has to be that face-to-face -face communication because we need to know who's in your neighborhood. Well, you know, yeah. when, when I was a kid growing up, you know, I grew up in Las Cruces and then Santa Fe, but as a kid growing up in Las Cruces, um, I remember San Valencia, sheriff uh, or the sh uh, sergeant of the Las Cruces Police Department. Mm -hmm. He was always at our Yaffa football games. The police oh, yeah. was always down in the community. Now, part of it was we had community centers, yes. and that's where a lot of activities took place, and that's where a lot of the maybe your, Pal, your, the your police your athletic, the police athletic lead, yes. all that stuff. Yeah. And one of my best friend's dad was one of the coaches. So. Mm -hmm. The police were always at our little league games. We're always part of our community. And I get Cruces is a lot different because it's a smaller mm -hmm. community than maybe in Albuquerque. But I feel like those programs have been cut away because we've cut social programs and we've cut after school programs away. And that's really, those are the things that actually drive everybody together. Are you seeing that? Are you guys doing things in the community like that? Uh, where, where do you see that going? We have school support deputies in all the middle and, and high schools. But what we really need them is in the elementaries. So kids have access. Oh. Really what drives, I know sometimes people say, what drives point. crime? Lack of access to what? Activities, income, yep. opportunities. So it's really access. So if you give people access, so to speak, let's say law enforcement into the elementaries, then they may have access to other activities, social workers, social uh, opportunities. Uh, they, are the, uh, real, they can form a relationship. So if they have issues at home, they can confide with the officer so they can get them the help they need. So they have that sense mm -hmm. of security. I mean, we're 50th again with child welfare. Right. A lot of kids child go to safety too. Kids yeah. go to mm -hmm. school hungry, and mm -hmm. you have to be able to identify that if they're going to school hungry, then they're in survival mode. And what are they going to do? They're not taking things because they want to steal or commit a crime. Mm -hmm. They're taking things because they need to eat. And and also the culture. I think uh, part of the tragedy I've seen over the last. I don't know, five, maybe five or six years is just this general feeling that cops aren't good guys. You know, everybody's pulling out their cell phone, they're cussing at the cops, they're calling them names. How do you fight against that kind of bad publicity where people, because I've, I've always said this on my radio show, police work is a dirty business. Criminals don't want to be caught, right? Mm -hmm. you know? And people are shocked when they're like getting stuffed or cuffed or, you know, it's, a, it's, it's hard work. And for everyone to pull out their cell phone and judge officers based on a call or the interactions and little bits of information, to me, that seems to be one of the hardest things about your job these days. How are you working with people understanding that cops aren't bad people? You know, you see even Antonio Brown, he's sitting there cussing out the cop and the cop's just doing their job, Right. Yes. you know? Yeah, so often there will be people that will provoke you, trying to get you in a position of getting into a altercation for whatever reason, civil lawsuits or what, may, mm -hmm. what they may do. Yeah. They have YouTube channels. In our case, what we try to do is promote uh, our deputies through social medias, opportunities like this to sit side by side with you and get a mm -hmm. better understanding of who they are, understanding that they live in this community just like you do. Yeah. They go to the same churches, go to the same businesses, go to the mm -hmm. same schools and are invested are vested in this community. So they are here to really help people. They want to have a quality of life that is no different than you. And we all came from families that uh, our parents wanted to have a little bit better for us. And that's the same thing we're trying to do for this next generation. Well, and, yeah, you know, and, that's and, true. It's a good point. Eric made a statement in the earlier segment that, you know, car theft is, is a violent crime. And Eric and I have these little conversations because I believe drug addiction, behavioral health, 
homelessness is really the root of about 30 40 percent of the crime and if we solve that on a social basis it would uh, it would uh, it would <clears throat> free up a lot of your officers times to really focus on the on the violent hard criminals as we call, as we say talk to us a little bit about the frustration because when I was on the campaign trail and I was in some of the smaller communities the number one frustration I heard from law enforcement was we are picking up drug addicted sick mental ill people because there's no place to go mm -hmm. help us help us understand what you guys have to deal with on that side and if we can solve that socially does that help you on the law enforcement side oh absolutely anytime you have more access again uh, when you have access to those type of resources then you're better off but if it's uh, turnstile justice or or opportunities where if you drop somebody off and they're back in the street again because all you gave them is a donut and a, 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 some hot chocolate or a mm -hmm. cup of coffee, then you're dealing with the same person, just a little bit more sugar, right? right. So, <laughs> so for me, it's really figuring out what do they need and how do we meet them again in the middle, <coughs> right? So you meet them in the middle with providing them with the, their needs. And so it's really identifying needs. Well, and that's what we talked about is like, you know, I always tell people we don't have a DUI issue. We have an alcohol issue. We, we you know, the, the minor crimes that we deal with is really tied to addiction and things like that. So I've always said if we can kind of eliminate and put those folks into social job training programs and get them away from law enforcement, one, it helps you guys tremendously. And secondly, one last thing is the number of officers do you need are you having a hard time recruiting officers are you are you you know it sounds yeah, like and it sounds like back up. and it sounds yeah, like Bern, it, sound, it sounds like yeah. Leo is like doing well yeah okay. no we do do team team policing so that's okay. one thing we encourage because we want to make sure our deputies are safe but this is what i can tell you and this is something i i think all our departments are very proud of and so is our organization and attorney general Barr asked me this and so did attorney general sessions they asked me where i was with our staffing and, I, and I'm probably the only, if one of the only uh, heads of agency, where, whether it's a sheriff or chief of police, that can say that we're 100% staffed. Wow. Okay, so I'm gonna, that's I'm gonna, great. That's a great. That's I'm going to ask you a question that you might get mad at because uh, there's rumors flying around. We have about a minute left in this segment. Sure. You're going to stay with us, though, because we're going to talk about the business community. Sure. But what's this rumor that you're running for mayor? I would not get mad Hey-o! <laughs> hey so, so, so this is. Have you announced yet? This is what I've done, okay. Eric. Uh, and by the way, I'm asking you, is it a rumor or a fact? So this is, this is the truth. The truth is that <laughs> I said I would, I would run two terms as a sheriff, and I've had a great opportunity and great success doing this. And I said I would consider running for higher office. You know running for a higher office that once you make that uh, commitment, yeah. everything changes. Correct. The only way it becomes official is the day you declare on paper. Right. So I'm waiting for that day, and once I do, then it will be official. Are you thinking about it? 100%. I was going to say, I think he just Do you think it. you could do a better job than Keller? I think I could do the better job than a lot of people. Okay. So, so let me ask you one quick question. And we're going to... We'll, we'll, we need a breaking news sound. No, no, but... No, well, I, it's, it, it's been rumored, so it's, I, don't, I don't think yeah, we're breaking any we're news. We're not but, breaking news. But let me ask you a question. On that point, you know, as law enforcement, what makes you think that you're ready for being mayor? Or what, what, what would make you different than Mayor Keller right now? I think that the number one issue in the Albuquerque metro area, because we get called on it every day and we get summons by the public every day for help and their desperation for help on crime, mm -hmm. is that crime is the number one issue in Albuquerque, bar none. I agree with that. You know, I, I, I mean, if say, you it could, makes sense. If you I mean, could it totally clean makes up sense. the crime, yes. Anyway, but we'll be back, and Manny's going to stick with us. Sheriff's going to stick with us, and we're going to bring, uh, we're going to talk about business. We're bringing another guest on to talk about how it's affecting business because we talk about it all the time. But we'll be back right after this. If you want to improve your reading skills, don't feel like you're alone. Thousands of us in northern New Mexico can't read or write. I used to be just like you, and today I not only read and write, I write movies like Blood and Blood Out. Call the New Mexico Coalition for Literacy today, please, at 1-800-233-7587. Get that tutor, learn how to read and write, and open up a whole new life for yourself. Paid for by the New Mexico Coalition for Literacy and aired in cooperation with this station. I'm Ben Lucero, president and owner of Indigo Mortgage. We are a locally owned and operated mortgage company right here in New Mexico. This means your loan officers and processors are right here to serve you. Indigo Mortgage offers better rates and terms than that of big banks and out-of-state lenders. Our mortgage divisions include residential, commercial, construction, reverse mortgages, and VA mortgage loans. Let us serve you with an exemplary level of care. Indigo Mortgage, because nobody cares more about your mortgage loan. 
Welcome back to Let's Meet in the Middle. Joining us now, Elizabeth Vinsel. You are an attorney and a business owner. And coming back with us again is Sheriff Manny Gonzalez. Thank you both for coming uh, on today. We really appreciate it. And I want to begin with Elizabeth and your frustration as a business owner and what you've seen with the nuisance laws and homelessness on Central and how hard it's become to do business on Central. Well, I was thinking while I was watching here, um, it seems like one of the biggest problems is lack of respect mm. from, from those people toward us, from the people who feel entitled to be homeless and kind of just roam about, um, and lack of boundaries. And they, there's mm. just a problem with people coming and they'll just start opening your car. Um, they'll come and rattle your door, try to come in. They want to use your bathroom. They'll go to the bathroom on your business if, you know. And um, it's just constant. We didn't, none of us who were in business went into business to clean up after other people. Yeah, um, yeah. And one of the right? things, you, you were, uh, Elizabeth, you were on a couple of news, that's how we found you, you were a couple of news organizations. You've been very vocal in the, in the. I don't know if it's the International District, but it's in that Knob Hill kind of we're area. We're East Knob Hill, Highland, East Highland Knob Hill. area. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you're seeing a lot of, as, as you put it, you've seen a lot of stabbings, a lot of interaction, a lot of break-ins. Uh, we're all assuming tied towards drugs obviously homelessness. Um, I know that there's been a push there. The whole topic around your community right now on this area are like 7-Eleven stores and gas stations, things like that. Seems like that's kind of a big hangout. Is that more of a big, uh, an issue than other small businesses that you're seeing in your community? Um, well, yes, it's the same because they, they pilfer through Walmart, they pilfer through Walgreens. Those are both in our area. Mm -hmm. Our area is from Washington to San Mateo right on central mm -hmm. and so those two businesses suffer tremendously because people who want something they're hungry or they mm -hmm. need to sell something to get drugs they just go in and take things sure. and we're really concerned because those are members of our group we have a group they are called hub 66 it stands for highland unified businesses and we're really concerned that there's not enough support for those types of businesses and if they can't make a go of it then we just have empty buildings and that's what we don't want to see is a bunch more emptiness. Empty building, right. And what are you hearing from the city council like Pat Davis? Uh, do, do they care or do they want the business owners to foot the bill and say, that's the cost of doing business in Albuquerque. Hire push, your own security. They push put up back. don't poop here signs. There was one business downtown that put up a sign, don't poop, don't poop. here. Right. Okay. Yeah. That's I, ridiculous. I didn't, see, I didn't see that. Yes. Button. No, they put it up. I, I believe you. I believe Yeah. That's the big bite down there. Off yeah. The center. Right. Yeah. No, um, we, not all city councilors are the same, but, but we do feel that some of them are taking a position of anti-business, I guess you could say. They want to be something else. Um, they want to think that all businesses like Walmart and Walgreens are bad and they're part of the big corporate something or other. Mm. So um, their, their attitude a lot of times is, you know, pay for your own security. Um, you just can't afford that and also um, security can't do anything yeah, what specifically. Is, right. You pay for some well, guy to watch, you're paying for some guy to watch well, you run out me, the store with all your stuff because right. they can't tackle them. I want right. to be, I be sheriff, sheriff, I want you to bring in the conversation yeah. because the reason we want you to stay on this segment is because you hear this a lot from the business community. Mm -hmm. we've, taught, we've had business leaders on our show talking yep. about this. It hurts the economy, it hurts everything by the way, yes. it hurts everything. So how, what are you guys, what are you guys doing within the force, working with the business community, uh, work, reaching out to the business community? How are you guys working together to, to try and solve some of these problems together? Well, first of all, the taxpayers are already paying for that service, correct? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so exactly. Yeah, that's where our taxpayers go to right. pay. Oh, no, not according to Pat Davis, hire your own security. Yeah. yeah, no, we pay fortune. We pay fortune in taxes, property taxes. We pay gross receipts. We pay taxes every time we turn around. Oh, yeah. So what we're doing is we're reaching out to those business owners that were, are soliciting our service. And so at times we're, we'll have the opportunity to go to their neighborhood association meetings, find out what some of their uh, problems are in their areas, then we'll collaborate with somebody like Elizabeth and their group. And then our catalyst, along with their catalyst, will get together, identify that problem, and then go out there and do proactive law enforcement in their community. Let me ask you a question. When they reach out to you, what if they're within the Albuquerque city limits or it's APD? jurisdiction because yeah, that's my how, brother's issue how, how, do, how does that work with you guys because that's what i've heard from business leaders is like well manny wants to help us but he can't because it's within the city limits help us there with that what you're working together or is there collaboration between apd those those operations i mentioned to you earlier 90 some percent of those were done in the city right 
And so it's the, the deconfliction pieces that we've, we invite Albuquerque Police Department. Sometimes they've mentioned that they're uh, grossly understaffed. So what we'll do is we're just letting them know and then we just go into operations. And as long as you know, we're making each other aware, that's making each other safe. So uh, you know, we, we're as concerned about the Albuquerque police officer's uh, safety as, as so is the public. So we're going out there aggressively to find whether they're misdemeanor or mm -hmm. felons that are outstanding and, and take, or placing them under arrest or actually cap, cap, uh, capturing people in the act of these crimes. So uh, this is going on every time we go out. We collaborate with APD. We meet with APD almost every month. Um, and my view is that APD, most of the officers actually want to do their job. They really want to be cops. They went to be cops so they could be the sheepdog to help us, right. you know, keep the wolves away. But they're very much handcuffed. Um, mm. The prior chief of police made a rule that they can't do anything about misdemeanors. My understanding is they have a little flashcard. Um, the flashcard of the things they can't we can do. We can arrest you if, and they got to check right. all these boxes, right? right? And I've heard that from so many, that that's really frustration uh, to them. And so the problem is, you know, if they respond to our calls, and most of the calls we're going to make are misdemeanor calls. You know, for example, we had a guy standing by our dumpster with a big knife, a buck knife. Oh. And we needed to lock the dumpster, you know. He wouldn't move, and it looked like he was going to come after us yeah. with the buck knife. Right, right. And so what are we supposed to do? You know, so we called the APD, and they didn't, they weren't able to get there for quite a while, but I had a lot of trouble with the dispatcher um, turning on me and saying I was threatening this poor man with his knife. And, I, and I'm, I mean, what? yeah, <laughs> no, it was absolutely crazy. So I think they kind of need to look at the atmosphere that they're creating in getting APD to dislike us us people, us business people. Because I think in our area, we've improved the relationship tremendously between businesses and APD. Uh -huh. um, they're great guys, most of them. We, we've called in the sheriff and we've asked everybody to talk and, and get along with each other and cooperate and we don't see a problem with that. Um, but, but the problem is they cannot respond to misdemeanor calls. And that's what most of us are gonna make. I, I, wanna, wow. I, I don't want wow. the whole show to be about all the issues, let's come up with some solutions. Like, I understand some of the stuff you guys are already implementing, but you know, working with APD, what's the solution? Is it just getting out there more in the community size, what you guys are already doing on the business side, Elizabeth? Elizabeth, well, let me go to Manny. What's the solution that we can help the business community grow their economy? What are you guys seeing? The collaboration, they need to feel safe first. Yeah. Uh, you can't build anything, you can't even, go, you can't go to school you can't do certain things unless you're safe. That's a basis for all, all things, even in government. You have to have public safety. You have to have access to public safety. So we're trying to give them that gap so they can do a business there in an area that is trying to thrive. But they're struggling because that last lack of security. So yeah. every opportunity we get, we go in there and we're as active as we can be without letting go our, of our responsibilities in the unincorporated hey, Jeff, areas. Jeff, I know you want to focus on solutions, but I, I want to take it back just one second. Do you feel like, as a business community, the mayor is supporting small business in Albuquerque? No, not really. Well, that's, I, that, I don't that's feel I we're, gonna... we, we aren't really reached out to as a business community and mm -hmm. say and ask, what can we do to help you? Um, we don't know if our comments to APD even make it back. Um, we, J.J. Griego used to be the commander in our area, and I know he works with the mayor. Um, and we, you know, we know some of our comments went there when he went up to that position. But I don't hear from any of them anymore. So, wow. Um, but Elizabeth, one of the questions I was going to ask is, yeah. is, on that note, what can law enforcement do? As, as a business owner within that community, what can law enforcement do to to clean it up, to make it safer, to, to make it better? Or is it from the state level all the way down the bound? Because, you know, it, it's simple as let's create, let's solve this here and then build from there. What can the community, what can the police officers, what can the community do to help small businesses? Well, for one thing, um, for example, the 7-Eleven you're talking about. Um, there are there are 7-Elevens all over Albuquerque right. that sell alcohol. And they do not have the problems that these 7-Elevens, especially the one on Solano, I'm going to focus on that one, uh, that they have. And it's because there are so many homeless people that the city, the city created this problem. They've put services along Central. They, they don't do anything to stop the homeless people from bothering us. And so those, those people are going in the 7-Eleven and stealing things. Um, 
I actually reached out to the 7-Eleven after I heard this impetus to try to shut them down. And I found out that a lot of the stuff that they're being blamed for are things that happen at the bus stop outside. Yeah. People call, you know, there's a fight, or they have a phone that's open all night, and so people come over and make a call, and it, they get blamed so for it. So the city's solution is shut down the business. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Well, we got art. We, can, we got <laughs> art. Just put them on art. We can, send them, on art. we can send them to the, new homeless, down, we can send them to the new homeless area. Yeah. And, the, and the problem is that business, I don't think, had notice, and they don't even meet the same criteria as other places. Wow. There's a Circle K across in the state fairgrounds that's terrible. They aren't even including that. Um, I think it's people who um, have a view that the 7-Eleven represents some kind of imperialist force and they want to shut it down. Well, I, I think that's definitely your side of the party there, my friend. I, you got to own that. I, 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 you got to own that. I think we're all kind of on the same side of law enforcement and let's crack down on, on these kind of things. Yeah, but I agree. as we wrap up the segment, uh, Manny, is there anything that we haven't covered that, that you guys are doing? Because clearly you're reaching out to the mm -hmm. community, you're reaching out to the business community. It seems like Bernalillo is moving in the right direction uh, through your leadership, so thank you for that. But is there anything else that we haven't covered on the show today that you want to talk about? I think the w one thing that's important is that, you know, we're talking about helping solve a problem, but it's much greater than just a law enforcement issue. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of social problems that they're having in these areas and that we need to mobilize some of these other entities within government or the private sector uh, to include faith-based groups to get out there. Uh, let's get off our couches, so to speak, get out there into the public, mm -hmm. mobilize with us on these operations, meet these people in the middle, out there in the wow. streets to sit there and find a resolution for them. Some of these people that are getting shipped here, they need to look at maybe reintegration, uh, 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 let's say programs to figure out, hey, do you have a better support system from where you came? Call them back up, get them the help they need, get them back in touch with their family, and get them the support they need because, because there's no way that the taxpayers of New Mexico or Albuquerque should be responsible for that. Elizabeth, I agree with, with that. With 20 seconds to go. Um, I don't think Albuquerque can be the dumping ground for all the homeless people in the United States. We don't have the resources, and those of us who are peddling and peddling to pay the bills and pay the taxes, we mm -hmm. just can't peddle that hard. Yeah. We well, can't I, support. I, I'm sure they weren't shy about taking 7-Eleven CRS, you know, their gross receipts taxes. Well, but, and, you know, shut and, them down is the solution. Well, and I'm sure we all got to work together, because it is. It's a community. Yeah. And, and, I mean, again, it takes a village to solve a lot of these problems. You have to start from top to bottom. But anyway, Sheriff, we really appreciate you joining us today. Well, Elizabeth, thank you today for joining us. Uh, we'll be back right after this. And don't forget, Indigo Mortgage has the best mortgages in the state. Yep. Benny does a great job. He's a great guy, too. We'll be back right after this. Find us on Facebook at Let's Meet in the Middle, or you can email us at meetinthemiddlenm at gmail.com. Welcome back to Let's Meet in the Middle. So uh, it's some incredible information. I learned a lot this well, I'm gonna show. Have to, I'm literally um, going to have to go back and watch our show like five times on TiVo. Okay, yeah, because <laughs> it's a lot true of True or not issues. true, Albuquerque has a massive crime problem. Oh, absolutely. Is the business community frustrated? Absolutely. Does it feel like the mayor's doing anything for the business community? Clearly not. I mean, based on what I've seen, and, and I think, and if I you've think, got business owners putting signs up that say, don't poop here, I know. Yeah. Remember I've the? Heard I think there was a Twisters or a Hurricanes or so. I don't want to put a business name on it because I can't remember. But they put a sign on and said, "We don't have money right now, so don't come rob us." Do you remember this? I don't remember that one. We, we, but no, we but I, th I think carry cash I, uh, due to the crime. You, if you're paying with cash, we can't help you. Well, and that's I'll a travesty. I tell you right now, you know, Manny and I got together for breakfast a couple of weeks ago, and mm -hmm. he was starting to tell me some of this stuff. I said, "Man, we got to come have you on the show." And that's what that's yeah. what really kind of talked mm -hmm. about. It. And you know, and and. I have just seen Bernalillo County do a great, great job. They're, as you said, they're fully staffed. staffed. They're fully staffed. He's done a great job. I'm telling you, if, I have never met a sheriff. You know that I, they don't even know I'm friends with Manny. Yeah. I go up to him and say, "How's your boss doing?" And they rave about him. Yeah, right. No, it's and it's, so it's, it's about culture. leadership. It's about he, leadership. He has created a culture of support for there his deputies and his deputies. That's the one thing that resonated with me, and that's why I think if he did run for mayor, he'd be a really good one. Because when you can get your deputies go, to go to battle for you, and, and he did in those operations that they were running. Right. What What was the one thing he credited? Did you hear it? Right. His, his, deputies, his deputies. Absolutely. Doing Relent, doing the work on Relent, the ground. Relentless pursu yep. pursuit. And I'll tell you right yep. now. There's a lot of Dems in my party that were upset that William Barr, the Attorney General, 
came here and did a whole press Why? conference. That was my point. Is like, wait, they're giving federal funding, and there is a reason that they picked mm -hmm. Albuquerque. What one because of the crime, and we're number according to the FBI, we're the second highest rated crime in per the capita, country per capita. So in per one thousand people, we kill more people than anywhere in the country. Well, it, just all kinds of crime, yeah. violent crime. Yeah. And, uh, and there is a reason William Barr picked this. Yeah. Uh, some of the dams thought he picked it because of the, because uh, Trump thinks New Mexico was in place. It was a political, it was a political move. And so all what? Of, and by so the way, what? All, those, so what? all those are political moves. So what? But my point is we got federal funding. There is a reason they picked Bernalillo County sheriffs to partner with yep. and be the lead. Let me make that very clear. Yep. They're partnering with everybody, but they've asked Manny and the Bernalillo County sheriffs to be the lead on this because they see that. And then, and then one thing that I asked him, um, and we talked a little bit about it, mm -hmm. is Operation Surge. Yeah. They didn't even include him or his group. They were supportive on the outside, but they didn't even include him on Operation Surge. Because he's why wouldn't you tap well, into that? And again, resource. I think he wow. saw that you're going to go through, you're going to go round people up for political and gain. And then let him go. But then let him go. He, he was frustrated with that too. Smart that he didn't get involved in that because, as we said, like 80 percent walked up from spending the I think it was the, 83 the money right? on those salaries to right. bring state cops down. Um, I do want to say one, one thing about uh, Manny, and and that's one thing that that resonated me with me with the sheriff is so. The big push for lapel cameras, he wanted the data on how it makes police work better. He pushed back, and if I'm a sheriff or a deputy and my sheriff is going to bat for me like that, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be a pretty loyal guy to that. You know that. No, and so. I think he's proven, when we had the conversation, I think he's proven that, and all he says is, show me the evidence yep. that it helps because he actually thinks it hurts law enforcement yep. and creates more issues for law enforcement that I think APD has been seeing. Yeah. Um, and again, so let, show me the but evidence me, but, where APD but let me talk has to done a more effective job of keeping crime down in Albuquerque with all of the DOJ requirements. Has it helped or has it hurt APD? The evidence is clear. Well, record homicides, record auto thefts, record crime, child welfare at an all-time low. And none of it's worked, well, as and usual. Think, I, and I think what Sheriff Gonzalez is talking about, too, is he's really for, he, you can tell, he's really gone into community policing. Yep. And not just saying it, but going out and talking to. But doing the work. But talking to businesses, talking to communities, talking yeah. to teachers, being out there and doing that. And I think, again, when you look at his force, they have a different tactical strategy. There's a different is, vibe to a well, Bernalillo you, County officer. Their point is yeah. we come in and survive the day and let's all go home and, and talk about that. But yeah. hey, one of the things we want to talk about is um, um, today and this week in the paper. Okay. Um, hemp business poised to boom in New Mexico. Bloom, they said or bloom, to bloom. Bloom in New Mexico. Yeah. And, uh, and it's a great story, but it is. And, and I asked people to take a look at it. You know, I'm involved in it, but I think it's one of those things that you're we can... You're just saying that because you're quoted in the story. Well, I am quoted in the story. Come on, But man. I think it's a great opportunity no, for is. New Mexico. Yeah. It's an agricultural thing. It also, it's it's not cannabis. It's not THC, uh, you know. And and will it be competing with recreational marijuana? No. And how convoluted no. will the industries get? It won't get... In fact, they're but keeping it, it very... Do we separate. really want to move that way? They're keeping it very separate. And if you think me, crime's out of control you, right now, though, you watch cannot, them recreational well, on, we're not talking marijuana. About, we're not talking about it. Because, hemp yeah. cannot, hemp, uh, cannot get you high. Yeah. It's the same medical benefits. It's great for our agriculture, and it makes a mu it makes different fiber products. That's a different, different show. Things. So that'll That's be a whole a different, different show. show. But go look at the Albuquerque Journal did a great story about hemp uh, booming in, in our in our state. And we didn't even get to talk about the uh, kind of prison riots and your dad's kind of involvement. Well, we can we that. can talk about that next week because it's yeah. the 40th anniversary. Of the Albuquerque Journal is running yep. a thing on that. And then that that series of articles was. And if you think that criminals aren't violent. Just take a look back, and you think it has it gotten better or worse? That was really bad. That, that was, was bad. bad. But hey, we're going to go mortgage. We're going to we're going to go to commercial. When we come back, we're going to do our last segment on our Facebook, Twitter conversations we're having that have. We're going to take questions. We're going to take questions. We'll too. take your and questions so we'll take when your we come questions. back. But uh, we'll be back right after this. I'm Ben Lucero, president and owner of Indigo Mortgage. We are a locally owned and operated mortgage company right here in New Mexico. This means your loan officers and processors are right here to serve you. Indigo Mortgage offers better rates and terms than that of big banks and out-of-state lenders. Our mortgage divisions include residential, commercial, construction, reverse mortgages, and VA mortgage loans. Let us serve you with an exemplary level of care. Indigo Mortgage, because nobody cares more about your mortgage loan.
will be ready. Hear it. What peace process you are talking about? As they hear. 35 fields and we're getting nowhere. They're evil. That's all they are, evil. Feel it. It's all because of your politics. As they feel. We have to stop murdering each other. See it. As it is. As long as this problem is not solved, more suffering will happen. Maya Margit for the Media Line. Charles Biblazer for the Media Line. The Media Line. This is Felice Friedson reporting for the Media Line. Changes the way you see news. Visit us at themedialine.org. The Media Line, the American news agency covering the Middle East and a Sun Broadcasting news source report. Welcome back to Let's Meet in the Middle. Uh, again, Jeff Apodaca, Eric Strauss. Well, I, and uh, I, I think... crime and punishment, what I've learned is, off the top, is if you do crime in Albuquerque, there is no punishment. <laughs> well, at Look least, at how frustrated at least, Elizabeth was. At least 47%. Yeah. But let's go, let's go back to, before we wrap up the show, you know, we've been, we've now, I've come now eventually you to have conversations with me on social media instead of behind the scenes. Last week, yeah. we talked about the impeachment. Our show was about impeachment last week. Uh, we actually we actually asked the question, should they call witnesses? And we had over 9,000 people interact, over 350 uh, things. And I don't. And the number I, one those people that think no stayed no, and those people if, that think yes stayed. Exactly. Yes. If you look at the whole conversation, it was kind of right down the middle. And yeah. hopefully by hopefully by this week or next week, we'll find out. But the number one question that's been trans. So should the Senate do the work the House should have done? How, how if, if the House is demanding all of this stuff, isn't this the work they were supposed to get done when they voted unanimously to impeach him if you're a Democrat? Imagine being a Democrat thinking, oh, in the you know, Senate I don't now. think okay. I'll, I, I don't think I want to. We got to get to some more questions. I don't think questions. I want to impeach calm Trump. Down, okay, go ahead. Calm down. All right, go ahead. We just have to do that. And then the other question was, which has kind of trended the last few weeks, which I thought was kind of funny, is why does Apodaca have two cups and Eric only has one? Wait, where? What? Well, the, I think people have noticed that I'm drinking out of two cups. Oh, because you always stop for like a Diet Coke or well, something, right? Well, you don't supposed oh. to tell me. Because so, Jackie gets mad that I drink Diet Cokes oh, and I love my Diet Cokes. It's part of me. So one is water and one is Diet it's Coke. poison. Isn't it a big corporation? Uh, unhealthy. Coca-Cola, Pepsi, come sponsor our show because yes. I like drinking Diet Coke. By the way, I love Coke Zero. I'm a Coke guy. I love Coke Zero. Yeah, I'm a Coke guy. I love Coke I'm Zero. not a Pepsi guy. So see, we come to the middle on a lot of on things. a lot of stuff. Next week, Anyways, okay. next week yes, we're going to be week. talking about your favorite topic, red flag laws oh, and what the governor's red pushing through. Red communistic flag laws. Red communist. But that's what we're going to be talking next about week. next week. But hey, everybody, God bless you. Um, hey, never give up. And always Go out and make a difference. Never give up and always find a way.